Hello everyone, and welcome to a special Mahjong Day stream, which is actually secretly a video, and I recorded this about like eight hours ago, but I'll be paying attention in chat, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type it in, and I will be watching and can reply to your questions in chat, so... Yeah, I really wanted to do this as a stream, but uh, apparently the screen share software of the main uh, Richie Central is kind of bad depending on the internet, so it'll be a lot cleaner if I just do a video. So yeah, I put out a straw poll to see what am I going to do for this cool Mahjong Day stream, and the winner was Mahjong Warm-Up Practices, which I've actually separated out into Mahjong Warm-Ups and Practices. So, without any delay, what is a Mahjong Warm-Up? So, similar to a Mahjong, or not Mahjong, uh, similar to a warm-up in sports or music, warm-ups are something that you kind of do to get a firm grasp on your fundamentals, on the things that uh, you're going to be using every single game, and, you know, really dive deep into those uh, and kind of, like, learn them very, very thoroughly. Uh, in Mahjong, we also have fundamentals to the games that we use, and I'll be going over those in just a bit. Uh, in, I don't know, let's say music, you have your chords, in something like basketball, you have dribbling, you have your basic shots, layups, uh, free throws. All of these are fundamentals that you're going to be using every single game, uh, or every single, like, you know, piece of music that you play, or every single, like, hanchan that you go through. Uh, there's something you can't escape from. It's something that beginners have to go through and learn, step by step, you know. Um, it's something that even, like, the really, really good people, uh, they, they can't, uh, just, like, completely ignore them. Even, like, world professional, like, athletes and world professional, um, you know, pianists and musicians, uh, still go and practice, uh, to a certain extent, uh, these fundamentals every single day. So, pretty important. Uh, next thing is practices, or mahjong practices. So, similar to warm-ups, except a little bit more uh, personalized. So, these are something that you would do if you want to gain a certain skill. Or, if, in the case of Mahjong, um, something that you really want to just get down. So, I, I know everyone's had that feeling where you read Dina Chiba's uh, Richie Mahjong Book 1, and you're like, oh yeah, cool, this thing. And you're like, I know about this thing now. And then you jump into the game, and then suddenly you're not doing that thing. Uh, you know it, but you're not actually doing it. There's a dis uh, disconnection between what you know and what you do. And that's where practice comes into play. So, what practicing individual sk um, skills does is you're basically n narrowing down the focus of kind of like what you want to do in, in the game. Because even if you're like, okay, I'll just pay attention to this some, uh, you know, whenever it comes up but then you keep missing it, and you keep messing up, and you're just in a s constant cycle of that. Uh, this kind of breaks that cycle. This says, okay, I'm going to be like focusing just on this, nothing else, uh, and I'm going to you know, find all my mistakes that I'm doing with this, find why I, these mistakes occurred, and then go about fixing those mistakes. And you keep doing this and doing this and doing this until basically that skill becomes habitual. Uh, and once it becomes habitual, then it's pretty hard to mess up. You can still mess up, and if you never use that skill, uh, it's use it or lose it. But um, doing it this way means that you can finally get any of those like things you've been learning through like, Dina Chiba's book or wherever uh, to a level of automaticity. And at that point, you're like, wow, you kind of like do it without thinking. Um, I guess a good example of this is like shunting counting. Um, whenever you're first starting out in the game, you have to kind of like, okay, like what... Well, how, how many shunts in is this hand? You know, like, I gotta figure that out, kind of think about it a little. Um, whereas, if you look at pretty advanced players, and, and they're like, oh yeah, what's the shunts in this hand? They can just look at it, and boom, just instantly, oh, like it's this. Uh, they can play a game and know the shunts in of their hand at all times without actually, like, you know, consciously thinking about it. Uh, it's just something, it, it, it's like um, riding down the street and like looking up at like a billboard sign and you don't have to think about like oh what do these like individual words say you just your mind just kind of like automatically reads it uh so that's the same thing you're getting these different skills to that point of automaticity and then of course you can go and add more skills and it's a never-ending cycle all right so let's go to the next slide do 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 
Mahjong warm-ups. So, what are the fundamentals of Mahjong? Well, there's a lot. Um, I, I, I've had numerous conversations with a lot of people going over uh, kind of like the full scope of like what are like fundamentals, what aren't fundamentals, uh, and kind of the differences between them. So if you don't know much about like skill building, uh, generally skills can be divided into two different sections. You have the hard skills, which are kind of like things that are always going to be the same. Uh, so very like technical skills. Something that, you know, you uh, during the early stages, you'll probably have like a coach going over there and very, you know, minutely correcting like individual like aspects of it. So like if we're talking about baseball, it's like your swing. Uh, if we're talking about like basketball, it's like your uh, the form of like, you know, your shooting hand and all that. Uh, if we're talking about, I don't know, um, like piano, e even like how you like sit, your posture, everything. Uh, these are fundament these are hard skills that um, usually you practice by doing it a lot and doing it correct. Uh, there's only one answer to like these skills usually and um, yeah the training for them is usually very repetitive and very like to the point. Then counter that you have soft skills which are, not really exactly like one way street uh like there's only one correct answer for these these are usually more like flexible stuff so uh kind of like skateboarding where you know they have to like try and recognize um i don't know what else um if we're talking about football it would be like reading the uh if, if you're like the quarterback you'd be like reading the defense to see like where they're going so they kind of know like okay because this is happening right here, then like, oh, look, there's going to be an opening over here. You're recognizing different patterns. And then once you recognize those patterns, then you associate them to, uh, you know, basically whatever you should do because of those patterns. So it's like read, recognize, and react. Uh, Mahjong has a lot of this because uh, you're playing with four players. There's like constant movement going on. And so there's a lot of like um, pattern recognition. So when I was going through and figuring out, like, what are the fundamentals of Mahjong, I was trying to narrow it down mostly to hard skills. Things that are always going to be the same no matter what, uh, and then that you're basically going to be using every single game. So, first off, tile efficiency. Uh, <laughs> starting off with a bit of a weighted question. Uh, so what is tile efficiency? If you ask most people, uh, they'll probably say, oh yeah, it's that, you know, it's that ukeire stuff where you just try to figure out how, what's the most tiles that you can get to go to, like, the next Shanten, to get closer to Tempai? Yes and no. Um, so tile efficiency originally uh, was defined not as what is the fastest way to get to Tempai, but what is the fastest way to get to a winning hand, which is actually different. Um, but yeah, so within tile efficiency, you have stuff like Shanten, and you also have uh, Ukeere, or um, the available tiles that you can take in to move up to the next shantan. Uh, both of these are really important, and luckily for us, um, they never change. Like, the ukere of a hand, the available tiles of a hand, is always going to be the same. Unless, of course, you know, they're discarded, but that's just, like, minusing another number. Um, yaku building. This one's a little bit uh, hard and soft skill. Um... So it's like recognizing patterns and then kind of going for them. But the number of Yaku that you have in the game is pretty limited. Uh, I say that, but for beginners, uh, one of the hardest things at the beginning is, of course, learning Yaku. There's a lot of them, and a lo most of them you will never see in your lifetime. Or you, you, you'll hopefully see them, but eh, I'm still waiting for that Chiho and Tenho <laughs> one day. Uh, next up, scoring. This one's actually really simple. Uh, always going to be the same. Basically figuring out the foo of the hand, the han of the hand, uh, figuring out are they the dealer, um, or not the dealer, if it's a ron or it's a sumo, and then of course figuring out the resulting uh, hand value. Defense. Uh, this one's hard. So, base defense-wise, uh, I hope you've seen what is called the defensive chart, which is basically a list of the likelihood of 
you to deal in with a tile against a certain threat uh, based on, like, what that tile is. So if it's, like, an honor tile, if it's, like, um, an uh, honor tile you can see three of, if it's, you know, a four, if it's a suji of that, if it's uh, nakasuji, if it's an edge, uh, you know, if it's an edge tile, whatever. Every single tile has a certain probability, uh, mostly from statistics, that it can deal into a certain hand. Now, that's just, like, the base of it. Uh, if we dive deeper into this, um, defense is actually really, really hard. Uh, it, it, it's pretty easy to do, like, just, like, okay, but, like, to have really good defense, it's, it's actually pretty hard. There's a lot of factors that go into defense. Um, anything from, like, uh, all the tiles that have been discarded, uh, like, the number of tiles, but then you also have what are, like, the different discard patterns, what type of shapes could they end up with logically, um, who are you actually playing, what are the rule sets, uh, etc., etc., etc. So, yeah, defense, uh, is actually kind of difficult. You can do the, you can figure out something for the base, um, defensive chart pretty easily, but to go into a little bit more depth than that is a little bit harder. Um, score differences, uh, or I like calls like situational play. So situational play is something that you have to do based off like the current round and uh, the point differences that you have. Uh, the simplest one of these, of course, is oras. If you are in the last hand of the game and you are down by a person from a number of points, then you have to figure out what type of hand can you build or hire to actually get uh, to like where you want to be. So uh, that's actually something that is also you know really easy to figure out. Uh, just saying like okay, the differences between person A and person B are is this: one person is the dealer and one person is not the dealer. What is like the minimum hand value that you can run them to move up to your next placement? What's the minimal hand value that you can sumo to get to your next placement? And then if you can figure that out really quickly, then whenever you're building your hand in the game. Ideally, even before you uh, get into that final hand, uh, you should already know like where you're going and what you should be doing. So yeah, these are uh, some of the fundamentals that I'm going to be going over in my Mahjong warm-ups. Uh, if you want more info of these, um, a lot of these warm-ups I've been developing, I've also been teaching to a person I've uh, been teaching. Uh, her name is Esri, and she is a lot better at content creation than me. Uh, by a order of magnitude. So she has a blog, um, pathofhoo.blogspot.com. Go there, and she has written up uh, for each of these um, warm-ups that I've given her a kind of like full, uh, in-detail um, explanation of like how to set it up, how to do it, and so, yeah, check that out. All right, uh, so let's jump into some of these warm-ups real quick. First off, tile efficiency. Speaking of Erzy, uh, she is also an amazing programmer, and she has made this awesome site right here. Uh, let me switch over real quick. Whee! Which is the Tile Efficiency Trainer site. Oh, she's amazing, if you, if you don't know. Uh, all right, so what this site will do is basically it'll show you the ukeire of whatever you discard. So, like, uh, whenever you discard a tile, we're just trying to figure out what is the fastest way to get this hand into Tempai. Uh, but actually, we're not trying to figure that out. We're trying to figure out what is the best tile to discard to give us the highest number of uke ere, um each turn. So, uh, for my warm-ups, what I usually do is I'll go through these, and I have to guess from beginning to end... Um, what is the shanten, what is the best tile to get rid of, and then also what is the ukeere, uh, available tiles of each like decision that I make. Uh, and then I have the passing addition of, I have to do three in a row perfectly, uh, and they have to be three shanten or higher. Um, she also has an option in the settings to say, like, what is the minimum amount of like starting hand shanten that you want? Uh, so you can change it to one, two, three. Personally, I like keeping it at one, and if I get like a one shantan or two shantan hand, those are just something I have to do and get it right, or I'll be sad. Um, so yeah. Start out with this hand. So what do we got? So we got five, 
uh, six. So if we count the shunt in, we can see one, two, three, four, five. Five connections in the hand, so that's three shunt in. Uh, we have one block, two block, three blocks right now. So we're still missing two blocks. Um, so that means Kutsuki Tenpai, uh, or basically tiles that we can draw to connect to other tiles, will move this hand forward. For instance, if we draw anything around this two, that'll give us another block, um, and then that will move our hand forward into two shanten. So, what do we discard? Uh, if we look at our connected tiles right now, these form a block right here, our three fives, so we got form a block right here. Uh, this is a nice tatsu right here. So our floating tiles are technically the two, the six, and the nine monzu, the one, the five, Pinzu, and seven Sozu. Uh, each of these tiles basically has a number of tiles that they're connected to that will allow you to uh, draw and move to the next shanten. So in the case of two, we got one, two, three, and four. In the case of six, we have four, five, six, seven, and eight. In the case of nine, we have seven, eight, nine. Uh, in the case of 1, we have 1, 2, 3. In the case of 5, we have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And in the case of the 7 over here, we have a... What is that? Um, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Plus, because we have this cool Tatsu right here, we can also take in a 1 and a 4. <laughs> so, if you want to figure out the Yuki Eri, uh and this is not something that you should be doing in-game. Like, the you, you get a feel for it, but you don't actually need to know the number. Why I do this in practice uh, is for two reasons. One reason is because I'm going to be taking the protest soon, and uh, they actually have like questions like this, where they're like, "Ooh, what's the number of you know discarded or of potential tiles you can take in this hand?" Uh, but the more important reason is because you want to find the stuff. You you want to find the mistakes. You want to find what you don't know. And for warm ups. The point of warm-ups is not to get them perfect. It's not to say, like, I'm so good. Look, I did this warm-up and got it perfect all the times I did it. Uh, you're trying to find mistakes. And the mistakes that you find are going to be used to find your misunderstandings. So in the case of uh, Uke Ere, or available tiles, you're trying to find things that you missed. Uh, so for instance, if I calculate this and I'm off by, like, four tiles, and I'm like, wow, why am I off by four? Then I can look at it and say, oh, because this other tile right here, uh, which I didn't count, also uh, will allow this hand to move forward. You familiarize yourself with different shapes and the tiles that they can take in, so that whenever you're in the actual games, you just kind of like know this stuff. Um, so without any further, uh, without yeah, further ado, let's do this one. Uh, so right now we have a 6 and a 9. Because 6 can take in everything that 9 can, even if I discard 9, the only thing I lose is 9. Whereas if I discard like a 1, I'm losing the 1 and the 2, because this can take in the 3. Uh, and then this I would lose a lot, this I would lose a lot. So for this, the best thing to discard would be the 6 for um, available tiles. Then for the remaining tiles, I need to count the ukiere. Uh, the easiest way to do that is just to count the number of tiles that I can take in, and then minus the number of tiles that I have in my hand uh, that overlap with that. So for the two, I can use one, two, three, and four. That's four tiles. Uh, including the six, I can use the five, the six, seven, and eight. So I can use eight tiles right here. Um, for this, I can use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's another seven tiles. Um, so now I have 15 tiles. I can take in the 1 and the 4, so now it's 17 tiles. And then uh, I can take in uh, the 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So that's another 5 tiles right there. So in total I can take in 22 tiles in this hand. Uh, now I'll minus the overlap, so I got, um, including this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, not these two. 8, 9, 10, 11, and there's also a door indicator, 12, so 12 tiles. Um, so because there's four of each tile, 22 tiles, uh, and then if it's 12, we just divide that by four, so three. So in total, 19 tiles. Uh, so 19 times four, the easiest way is just to do 20 times four, which is 80, uh, and then minus it by four, which is 76. So I think, all right, this is like 76 tiles, right? Let's see if I was right. A. So right here it says you chose to discard the 9, which rolled it in 76 tiles. Alright. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, next draw. Draw the six. That moves our hand forward. Uh, so now we're at two shots in, and right now we have one block, two block, three block, four blocks. We're missing our pair right now, uh, and that means also that we can't take in another uh, Kutsuki tile anymore. Because uh, for your hand, it's four blocks, four groups of three and one pair. So we already have one potential group of three, two, three, four. Um, so because we have to take in a pair now, uh, that means that the one and the two are not as good, and then this seven is actually not as good as well. Uh, seven is actually the biggest one, because if we're just counting base available tiles, um, this would only have two tiles that we can take in, but like the one has like three tiles that we can take in. So in this case, the best tile to get rid of would most probably be the seven. Uh, so then if we count the remaining tiles, we can take in one, two, for this two, we can take in three, four. Um, we can also take in uh, the four and the seven over here, five, six. Uh, and then we can take in our, um, or what are they called? <laughs> uh, take in tiles for our pair. So we can grab another two, six, or a one. So that's one, two, three. Um, so that's three times nine plus uh, 6 times 4. <laughs> 6 times 4 is 24, uh, plus 9, which is, what, 33? So yeah, I'm going to say, is this 33 tiles? Let's see if I'm right. Oh, okay, 33. Then we move forward again. Uh, so now we got another draw right here. And so now we're one shantan away, and we have these two blocks that are remaining. We have our pair right here now, because we have the 5, 6, 7, and then the 5, 5. So we only need 1, 2, 3, 4, 16 tiles remaining. There we go, 16. And we can increase uh, this hand by drawing, well, we'll see if we draw them. <laughs> hey, alright, and with that, we have Tenpai waiting on 8 tiles. So that's an example of going from 3 shan 10 to 10 by hand without guessing all of these 100%. Uh, to start off with, like what I did for Erzi is just um, to do one hand from beginning to end that's 3 shan 10 or higher and get it like 100% correct. <laughs> that's a lot to take in. Um, <laughs> Alright, uh, going on to the next one because I am really bad at time management. Um, we have this, also, this other trainer that Erzi made, which is amazing, called the Oras Trainer, or All Ass Trainer. Basically, it'll give you a random situation, and you have to choose what is the minimum score that you can sumo to get third, what is the minimum score you can uh, run to, um, to get third, etc., etc. Uh, so, this is not that useful, truthfully. Um, you don't need to know, for the most part, that's like, oh, I can win a one Han 90 Fu hand in order to get second. Uh, you don't need to know it like that exact. Um, if, you, if you know just like a good estimate of like the base hand, so like, 1 Han, 30 Fu, uh, 1,000, 2,000 point hand, a 4,000 point hand, 8,000 point hands, that you can just figure out from there, that's usually good enough. Uh, but knowing the specifics can be kind of useful, and once again, the only reason I do this every day is because this is actually on the protest as well. So, yeah, don't mind me. Uh, so let's go and do this real quick. Let's see. Alright, what is the minimum score you can sumo to get third? Well, we are currently north... Um, Dealer is right here, hello in first, uh, this person is in third, and this person is in uh, is second. Um, there is currently a bug on this right now where if you calculate um, ties, uh, it does it incorrectly. So normally, because this is Oras, uh, and we're playing like Tenho rules, east after this becomes north, um, south becomes east, etc, etc. In other words, south will win all tiebreakers, followed by west, followed by north, followed by east. Um, so in the case of me being north, I cannot tie with south and west. Um, all right, so what is the minimum score I can sumo to get third? Right now, I am 5,800 points behind them, so if 5,800 points. If I sumo a 3 Han, 30 Fu hand, that will cover a 5,000 point difference, so that's not enough. Um, if I sumo a 2 Han 70 Fu hand, uh, that will cover a, what is that, 23 plus 20, that's 27, 
Uh, so it's 47 plus 12. So that is 59. So yeah. Um, so if I'd sumo a 2 Han 74 hand, that should be the minimum. Correct. <laughs> and it'll even show you right here. What's the minimum score I can run? That's pretty easy. Divide this by 2, so 25, so 29. Uh, but if I run them with a 29 point hand, or 29, 29, uh, 2900 point hand, uh, that'll give me a tie with them, and I'll lose the tiebreaker. So I need to go one above that, uh, which is 3200, also known as a 3 Han 25 Fu hand. Correct. Uh, if you do get it wrong, so let's say if I said, I don't know, um, 2 Han and, or 1 Han 90 Fu hand, which is that. 2,300. Oh, and if you haven't noticed, uh, you need to know scoring for this, so if you don't know scoring, don't do this. Uh, it'll say wrong. And so it'll show you, and if you want, it can highlight for the answers. So my um, goal to uh, do this one is pretty easy. I just have to go through this once and then get all of them correct. If I get any incorrect, uh, I still have to go and finish it all, but then I have to do it again until I get one 100% correct. Alright, what's the minimum score I can run uh, second to get third? Um, 5,800 points, which if I run them uh, second for, actually, if I divide this by two, that's what? Um, 5,800 points. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> actually, wait, 5,800 points. Yeah. Uh, so because I lose the tiebreakers to both of these uh, people, even if I win a 5,800 point hand, I'll be sad, right? Uh, so I have to go one above that. So 5,800 points for non-dealer is 2 Han and um, 90 Fu. So one above that is 2 Han 100 Fu, also known as 4 Han 25 Fu, 6,400 points. Yeah. And then what's the minimum score I can run first? Uh, that's actually the same. Second section is Ricci declarations. So now, if first declares Ricci, what is the minimum score I can sumo? That means I'm 1,000 points closer right here, 4,800 points. Um, so that's a basic 3 Han, 30 Fu hand. So if I sumo 1,000, 2,000, that'll move me um, as close as 5,000 point difference, which is just over that. So 3 Han, 30 Fu, sumo. First declares reach, what's the minimum I can run third? So now I'm 4,800 points away, which is, divide that by two, uh, 2,400. Um, the closest thing above that is Tuhan 40 Fu, 2,600 points. If first declares reachy, what can I run first to get third? That's 28, uh, or I'm sorry, 48. So closest thing over 48 is, um, what is that, 52. So, 340. And go do these all real quick. <laughs> Third Claire's Reach. What's the minimum I can get? Uh, that'll move down to 3,800 points. So, 3,800. Uh, if I get a 190, that would be enough. Is a 180 enough? Um, that's 26, which is 27. Uh, which is another 700, so that is not enough. Uh, so in this case, I think 190 is actually the answer. Yay! Alright, third declares reach. What's the minimum score I can run to get third? Uh, so it'll be down to a 3,800 point difference. Divide that by 2. Uh, is 19, so 2,000 point hand will work. So 2 Han 30 Fu. Correct. And if they declare Ricci, what's the minimum score I can run first? Uh, they'll be down to 3.8, so if I win 3.9, that works, so 3.30. Yay! And then finally, higher placements. What's the minimum score I can sumo to get second? Uh, second's right here, they're both a Mongon sumo, so I need a Hanemon sumo. So that's pretty easy. Uh, what's the minimum score I can run third to get second? Um, once again, Hanemon. What's the minimum score I can run second to get second? Uh, we said this before, if I run them with a 5-8 hand, I'll be tied with these two and I'll lose the tiebreaker, so I have to go one above that. Um, 
So one above one ninety is or two ninety is uh, two one hundred, which is four twenty five, also known as six thousand four hundred points. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Make sure you answer the right question. Uh, what's the minimum score I can sumo to get first? Dealer is uh, in first place, so that helps me a little. But even if I get a Baimon sumo, that only covers 24,000 points difference. So I need a Sun Baimon. Whoa. And it doesn't matter what you answer for the food with these, because uh, it's still the same amount of points. Similarly, for this one, you can answer a 1 100, a 250. I'm sorry, um, a 425, a 350, uh, or a 2100, and those are all the same. It doesn't care about like what the Han the Fu is, it cares about what the resulting score is. And then what's the minimum score you can run to get first? Uh, divide that by 2 is greater than a Hanimon, so I need a Baimon. Alright, and got those all correct. So yeah, it's just something a little fun. Uh, Alright, I am really bad at time management. Ah! Okay, next thing. Let's see, hide this real quick. Uh, next up, I have a magical tool called Hitori Mahjong Simulator. Uh, for more details on this, please check out Erzi's blog. Uh, she has an entire blog post with instructions on this. So this is a single person Mahjong indicator. And like I was saying before about tile efficiency, uh, you don't actually care about, you know, the ukeere exactly. You, you care about how, do you, how can you get to a winning hand as fast as you can. And the way that you figure that out is usually a bunch of different like patterns and kind of like uh, rules of thumb, like having a good end shape, uh, building up your like five block theory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Hitori Mahjong Simulator is actually really, really, really good at uh, figuring that stuff out. And you can also use it for different Mahjong practices, which I'll go over a little bit later. Um, so right here, um, that's the extended version. Let's see. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, so you'll have a hand, uh, and then you can ask that hand. Um, there's two modes. You can do like the super like advanced mode, which is like, hey, tell me this and calculate it for 30 seconds and include uh, changes within the same shanten. Or you could just sit, do the simple mode, which is uh, you know pretty easy, saying like, all right, what can I discard that'll move me forward, uh, but you know also move me forward in such a way that I can potentially like win the hand faster as opposed to just getting to tempi faster. Uh, this is the result screen. Um, this will show just the basics uh, for this cur current turn that we're on. So in this case, we're on the first turn. Uh, what is like the estimated value that we're going to get from this hand? Uh, this is no red Dora, by the way. Um, what are the available tiles that we can take in? Uh, what are the chances that we are going to sumo this if we are, have all of our draws available from beginning until Ryukoku. And then what are the chances that this hand is going to get into Tenpai? Uh, and then if you want, you can scroll down. This will show basically the estimated value for each turn uh, that you would have this hand. Uh, similarly, this would show the um, chances that you're going to win the hand based off each turn. Uh, and then this shows what are the chances you're going to get this hand into Tenpai based off the turn you're in. So if you have this hand, uh, which is also shown up here and down here, uh, if you have this hand and it is the 14th turn, you probably shouldn't push this hand because uh, chances are you're not going to get into Tempai. <laughs> uh, so yeah. And then you can discard a tile by clicking on it, and then it'll randomly draw a new tile. So if I get rid of like this, let me draw that, and then you can run it again. So it also has like a suggestion of like, okay, I think you should drop this. Um, if you notice the actual uh, kitaichi or the estimated value of these is actually really close. So whatever you have situations that you have in game can you know be like the deciding factor of like, oh, do I switch between like uh, this tile or this tile? Um, similarly, looking at the tiles in game and knowing like how many are there. Um, so the practice that I have for this is actually a little bit different, uh, but I'll go over that in the later sections. Uh, for worrying about like um, tile efficiency, though, this is actually a really good tool for tile efficiency. You know, try to figure out like, all right, what do I think is like the best thing for tile tile efficiency here, and then go and check yourself like, is this actually the best choice 
that will give me like you know the highest chance to get this hand into tempi or even the highest hand uh to or the highest chances to win the hand because those are different um i don't know if we can find a good example of that but let's see if i can actually this one might be good where we got uh not quite Discarding, discarding, discarding. Okay, yeah, this is just a really bad hand. <laughs> oh, here we go. So this is like a slight example. Uh, it's a really bad hand, but it's an example nonetheless. So discarding the two here actually has a better chance to get into Tempi than discarding the six here. Uh, but of course, um, discarding the uh, six right here, or even the seven, has a higher chance of winning the hand. Uh, this is a pretty like minute case that you don't really care about because the hand sucks. Uh, but there are some uh, a lot different uh, cases where... It's a lot easier to get into Tempi one way, but it's a lot harder to win that hand that way compared to another way where it's a little bit harder to get into Tempi, but it's a lot easier to win the hand. Uh, the biggest differences between these is usually your final shape. So this is a very good tool to kind of like do a little warm up and just going to go through a hand and say like, all right, what do I think is the best way to move this forward? What, what is the best way to practice tile efficiency with this hand? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I am once again bad at... Uh, Time management, so jump to the next thing. Uh, scoring. Once again, go to Airzy's blog to get this app. Uh, so this is a scoring practice app, which is a time scoring practice app uh, that will present you a hand. Uh, the rules it uses, I believe, are like Saikyosin rules. Um, so you have Kiriyage Mangan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. So... First off, I assigned uh, Erzi the, what is it called, uh, task for this one, to get a certain number of questions in a row 100% correct. Uh, then move that forward all the way up to getting all 15 in a row correct. And then after that, you can worry about time. So like, okay, get all 15 in a row correct and have your average time for each question under a certain amount. So I'll practice this real quick. Let's see, minimize that. All right, so uh, click right here, start the game, and then you can do enter and use your keyboard from here. So it'll show the round wind, uh, your seat wind. It'll show if it's a Ron or a Tsumo or if there's a Ricci, the door right here, and then you have this right here. So this is just uh, Chinitsu only, so 8,000 points. And then it'll show your time. Uh, and if you got it correct, if you didn't, you can go back and look at the question. And then you can even look at the scoring table down here. Uh, so this uses uh, total. So if, if you say like um, Sumo with a um, 3 Han 30 Fu hand, 1,000, 2,000 points, the correct answer will be the total of that, so 4,000 points. Whereas if you're on with that hand, it's 3,900 points. So got to be careful. Uh, so yeah, I'll just go through this real quick. Tsumo, so we got Tsumo Pinfu. No, anything. So Tsumo Pinfu is 400, 700, which is in total 1,500 points. So we got Ron, uh, we're not the dealer. And so we got Pinfu Tanyao, one Dora, 3,900 points, because we have no reach. This one, we got Tsumo this time, uh, Tsumo Pinfu. Once again, 400, 700, aka that in total. Okay, so this one right here. Um, so we got a Hote Ron. So we got Hote, and then we got two Yakuhai. Uh, so Hote, two Yakuhai, 3,900 points. And then we got another Hote right here. We have two Doras because we have a Khan. Uh, we don't see a 9 anywhere, and also that's no, none of those. Uh, currently, it is the south wind, so 
We have no other Yaku except for Haite, then we have to count the Fu. Um, 16, 4, 4, so it only goes over once. So that's just a 1,300 point hand because it's a Ron. All right, so this is actually a Yakumon. <laughs> it, it tries to fool you with those, so be, be careful. Um, there are double Yakumons, by the way, so if you get a Suwanko Tonki, it's actually 64. Ron, gross. Uh, so, yep, Nodora, and we got Ipeko, and then we got Helifu. Um, 16, 4, 2. Uh, so that, and then we have the Menzen Ron, so that goes over a couple times, so we're at 2,000. One Han, 60 Fu. So this time we're dealer, so you have to change uh, the points for if you're dealer. Um, Dora, we have one Dora right there, nothing, nothing. So one Dora, and then Chun. Um, the Fu is not enough to go over uh, that, so it's... Uh, 32 plus 16, which is 48. Uh, so 48 is 50, which is 70. So 270, which is 45. Oh, no! But then you're like, oh, shit, wait, I was dealer! Ah! And so it was actually 68. And whenever you get it wrong, it'll show that little, like, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, so you got a Ron, so this time you got also got a con, so you have to count that foo. Um, it's closed, so you have to count the men's end, so you got... 16, 4, plus another 2, and it goes over once more, so it goes up basically another Han. Uh, and then we just have Tanyao, so 2 Han and 60 Fu, but your dealer, so. Normally I don't talk while doing this, um, but I'll explain that in just a bit. <laughs> Ron, this is hand is just sad. So this is actually a Sananko. A very weird Sononko. Uh, adding up the foo, you have 4, 8, 16, and it goes over once more. So, 3,200 points. Dun, 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 dun. No Dora. We only have this, so that, that. And 3. Similarly, for this hand, a 1, uh, one Han 40 foo hand, if you Tsumo, instead of 1,300 points, it's actually... Uh, 1,500 points, because it's 400, 700. Run. So just that, and we have 4, 4, 2, so not enough, so just 1,000. Run, so we have 3 door right here, because we use Kirag and Mangan, it goes up to Mangan, so we have 8,000 points. And then finally, last one, we got double non right here, so one, two, three. Uh, for the foo, we got four, four, two, so it doesn't go over. 3,900 points, because it's a run. And then at the end, it'll show you, uh, this is your average score, what was your fastest, um, how did you do, what what like percentage did you get, and then your dawn ranking, which is amb ambiguous. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, um, for my practices, usually I'll have to go through and do like 30, 100% uh, correct in a row, and then follow it up with that by doing a number, uh, another like 15 in a row correct under a certain um, time, uh, which is usually about like six seconds on average. <laughs> uh, naturally, when I'm doing that, I don't talk. <laughs> so yeah, that's the scoring app. That's pretty nice. Um, alright. Next up, what do I got? I am really bad on time. Uh, next up, scoring practice, or not scoring practice. Um, next up I got a practice on Tenho. So, this one will use, uh, the bot mode right here. And this is basically a Mongon Shibati mode. So basically I have to win a Mongon. Uh, but the way I do it is, I, first off, I have to win something that has at least um, a, what is it, 30% uh, uh, plus Mongon chance. So, like, if I get Richie, Pinfu, uh, Dora, and Sumo, um, because I have Ipatsu chance and then also Uridora chance, then that has a chance to get a Mongon. So that's what's a Mongon chance. 
the second thing I have to win is a 100% confirmed Mongon, and I can use Red Dora. Uh, the third one is I can use a... Uh, without using any Red Dora, or not counting them at least, you have to make a confirmed Mongon. So yeah, that is the Mongon thing. Uh, <laughs> so what is like the purpose of this, and like what are you trying to do, and this hand is broken? I don't actually have to reach because it's already Pinfu Tanya Dora Dora, which is already a Mongon. Uh, so in this mode, you're playing against Simogiri bots, so all they do is draw and discard, draw and discard. Um, and what your goal here is, is to basically learn different patterns for making Mongons. You're going to find a lot of situations in the game. Hey. Meh. <laughs> uh, you're going to find a lot of situations in the game where you're going to need to get, like, a big hand. Or you're going to need to get, like, a certain, like, value to get out of a situation that you're in. Uh, and that happens a lot on Tenho, especially because you're doing the last place avoidance. Boom. So... What you need to learn is, how can you make a Mongon given whatever hand? What is the fastest route to a Mongon? So you want to look at your hand and say, what are the different ways I can get a Mongon with this hand? So that was a Mongon chance. Now we're at confirmed Mongon. If I want to get a confirmed Mongon, I need, let's say, Richitsumo and at least two Dora. Uh, or, or two Han. The Dora right now is a very hard to use north, or ugh, east. So... I have to figure out, like, all right, how can I make this hand into a Mongon? Uh, technically, I have three blocks right now for Honitsu. That's kind of hard. If I get into seven pairs and I get the door tile, um, or I get, like, Tanya or something, then that would work. Um, so I'm right now balancing between, like, okay, I could potentially even go for a Honitsu. If I get Honitsu closed, um, then I can reach you, and that'll be enough. I can technically move over to Sanshoku, uh, which is actually another possibility here. Um, you want to think of, like, what are the different... Uh, uh, uh. What are the different ways you can get uh, Mongons? And similarly, you can call on this. So, these are all Tsumagiri bots, and you might say, well, can't you just, like, you know, call for Honitsu every time? Yeah, you can. Um, similarly, uh, if you play a real game, it's actually not much difference if you have a hand that's really good for Honitsu and people are just dropping tiles because they don't know what Shibari is. Boom. Uh, so because I have the Dora right now, if I get Honitsu, Dora, Dora, uh, on like a Tonki, that would be a potential Mongon. Uh, and it only counts like for a Mongon if you win the hand. If you if Tenpai with it, then it doesn't matter. Uh, keep doing this until you win, um, you know, however many steps that you're at. So for Airzy's practice, uh, I believe she has to... Mm, uh, uh, yeah. She. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that was actually incorrect. Um, she has to win uh, a Mongon chance and then followed by a 100% confirmed Mongon. Uh, in my practice, I just go one above that, which is also throw in a 100% uh, confirmed Mongon without using any Red Dora, which is basically kind of like what the sand would be. And, of course, if nothing happens, game goes. Uh, for this bot game, it'll end whenever you get into South um, 4 and someone's over 30,000 points. And then when the game's over and you still haven't done your, like, you know, completed your task, you just jump into another game and keep going. Uh, so the big thing here is that you want to look at, like, different patterns. You don't want to just make a choice. You want to figure out, like, what is, like, the best choice for this? Like, look at your hand, scrutinize it. The time is pretty quick, so you have to, like, go and think about it. Uh, like, what is, like, the best choice that you can do? Um, similarly, because you have all these delicious discards right here. Hmm. Uh, that's unfortunate. Um, because you have all these discards, you can also do other Mahjong practices in this mode as well, uh, outside of just this, like, warm-up drill. So in this case right here, I would love to go for Honitsu, but I'm missing um, the components to get it to a confirmed Mongon. So this is my round win, but if I pull in like, the West, I still need some other round win. If I stay close, I have the option of going for Ricci or something. I can also take in the Red 5 uh, if it comes. Um, so right now, this hand could actually go Pon Pon. I could even move over to a uh, Mongon, or not Mongon, Toy Toy. Uh, but I'm still missing that last pair, so I'm going to opt for ignoring those and going for the Menzen route instead. If I get the red 5, uh, then I can use that. 
So right now that's discarded. Checks the time, realizes that I'm really behind schedule, so I should probably go faster. <laughs> So if you look on the board, you don't see any of the fives right now. That's pretty nice. You don't see any of the eights either, so that's pretty nice. But we only have one draw left. Uh, so now if I pawn, I can get Haite Tsumo, and that would work as well. Because I have one draw oh. left. If the red five comes out, I can also run on that, uh, and that would work. Uh, for this, I have like just the rule that you can't use Khan, uh, so you can't add any more Dora. Uh, so I didn't get the Haite, so bomb bomb. Yeah. Alright, so that's basically that drill. Uh, and for... There we go. And for scoring, uh, or defense, um, I don't actually have a good drill for defense yet. Uh, I've been trying to recreate Rex's uh, defense uh, game and then change around the parameters for uh, what is, you know, like, succeeding at the game. Uh, but still working on that, so... Yeah. Uh, I guess the best thing with defense might just be like an Anki deck of the um, defense chart. That might help. So yeah, these are just like small little warm-ups that you can do uh, before your game. Uh, just kind of like, it fills in usually just like, I don't know, in my case, like about 25% of my complete practice time just doing these. Um, yeah. And whenever I do get into actual games, it definitely shows. Uh, because you're not trying to be perfect on all these, you're trying to find your mistakes, uh, it really helps find stuff that you didn't know before, or that you thought you know, but you weren't actually 100% sure of. So, like, in the case of tile efficiency, you'll learn the characteristics of different, um, you know, patterns that you, you're not as familiar with. For Yaku building, you'll recognize different patterns for, like, going forward and, like, saying like oh i can make a manga on this way or oh i could have done this to make a manga you have to, you know keep asking yourself like what's the best way uh for scoring you can go and find mistakes um whether that's like oh i overlook chanta or oh i keep overlooking um the dora if it's like an honor tile uh for score differences uh, that's 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 this specific you ignore that so yeah that's basically my mahjong practices or warm-ups next section which i hope i have time <laughs> Uh, aside from Mahjong warm-ups, I also talked about Mahjong practices. So, there's two types of Mahjong practices. We have isolated practices and in-game practices. So, isolated practices are things that you can do in a specialized environment, um, outside of a live game where you have to keep track of, you know, and again, you're keeping track of a lot of information. Uh, you can't just focus on, like, one thing, usually. It's pretty hard. Uh, so this right here is like specialized training. You're getting rid of everything else in the game and focusing on just one thing. Deliberate training. Just focused on a single thing. Uh, and then you have in-game practices where you're basically sacrificing your game uh, for the greater good of your skill. So in that game, you're going to set your primary focus as the thing that you're practicing. Not like the results of the game. So you didn't do good if you got a first. You didn't do bad if you got a fourth. You did good or bad based off how you did this like practice that you're doing how you you're basically making the new like uh parameter the new goal yourself so i'll give some examples of these um so isolated practices uh so these are some things that i wanted to um these are some skills that basically i've had that i wanted to achieve in the past and ways that i went about developing practices to go and um, figure those out so one is estimating hand speeds using uh, the E20 Mahjong Simulator, which we saw before. So actually, I can show an example of that real quick. Um, we... So in E20 Mahjong Simulator, which I'll just go and make a new hand real quick, uh, you have a hand. So for this hand, uh, it'll only calculate anything three shots in or above. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four... Um, so we're still four shots in right here, so we don't actually have the option. But, as soon as we draw something that connects to anything, there we go, uh, now we have, um, three shots in. So at this point, uh, there's two modes in here. You can use the regular what would you cut mode, and you can use the extended mode. If you use the extended mode, uh, and then the exam, the specifics on this are on Erzy's, uh, Mahjong blog, it'll take a while. Um... 
for a hand that's like really far away from Tempai, uh, usually even like up to like 30 seconds, 35 seconds or so, uh, to just calculate this one hand because it's basically this this is not a um, mathematic uh, like probability thing. This is a simulator, so it will literally simulate. Oops, I was on the wrong thing. <laughs> Uh, so it'll literally simulate the hand, like, going from beginning to end, like, hundreds and, mil like, hundreds of thousands and of times, just, like, go, 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 go. Uh, and so, because it's doing that, it takes a while to actually get it. So, for this practice, what I do is, I look at a hand, and I say, alright, what do I think is the average time it'll take to get this hand into Tempai? In other words... How many turns, on average, 50% uh, or higher, um, will it take for me to draw this hand to get to Tempai? And then also, like if I'm lucky, let's say 25% of the time, uh, how long is it going to take to get into Tempai? There we go. Uh, and Hitori Mahjong Simulator actually has all this for me. So in this case, uh, I'm going to look at the blocks. So I got um, three shunts in hand with a one Mensu. Uh, two Tatsu, and a pair. So that's not bad. Uh, it's not super great. Uh, my floating tiles, I have the one, the six, uh, the nine, and the Haku. Um, right here, properly drop the nine or the Haku. Uh, and then, yeah. So what do I think this is? Uh, if I had to guess, I'm probably guessing it's around like a 7-11. So seven turns on average, uh, about like 25% of the time or 11 turns uh, for 50% of the time. Then I scroll down on here, and then Hitori Mahjong Simulator will actually tell me. Uh, so if we kind of reverse this, this is the number of turns it'll take to get into Tempai, and like uh, what is like the percentage of that. So if we have like, we're on the 17th turn with this hand, we're not getting this hand to Tempai. We don't have enough draws. Uh, but if we have three draws, then we have a you know, 2% to get into Tempai. If we have 4 draws, it's this. So we have 5, 6, 7 draws. So 7 draws is the first one above 25%, so that was correct. Then we have 8, 9, 10, 11. So 11 draws is actually the first above 50%, so that's also correct. <laughs> uh, and so for my practice for these, uh, I basically figure out, like, yeah, just that. Uh, look at the different patterns to try to figure out what is the average turn that I'm going to get this hand into Tempai if I just draw all the tiles myself. Similarly, I also want to look at how like good are certain uh, draws. So uh, one draw you might get might you know move up your estimate by just like a single turn, but another draw you might get might move it up by like six turns. Like there's some really good draws, and then that can also help you uh, figure out like oh. If I call this tile, how much does it actually speed up my hand? So this is a practice that I used um, for that, and yeah, it's actually very fun. Yeah, all right. Uh, next up, discard counting. So on that mode that we were just on, on Tenho, where we go around and, um, you know, we're playing uh, Mahjong against several different um, Simulgiti bots, so they just draw, discard, draw, discard. Um, we can also practice our discard counting. So if we go to that, so let's say right here. So I usually do like my Yaku building and Tenho er, and uh, counting at the same time. So whenever they discard a tile, you just count how many are on the board. So there's like one nine so there's like only one or so there's one of these. Uh, but more importantly, you care about like how many uh, remaining tiles are there. So in this case, it's like three. Three. Well, technically two if we count this. So three. And then, yeah. Uh, knowing the exact number of discards is kind of useful uh, for a number of things. Uh, usually you don't have to like know it all the way unless you're trying to be insane like me. Uh, and trying to use this for another skill that you're trying to build up. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so you can also do that in game, but of course, whenever you're in a game, it's a lot harder, right? Because you're trying to keep track of everything that's going on. You're trying to keep track of your opponents. You're trying to keep track of your, you know, your hand, your score, how much you need. 
Uh, but in an isolated field, you can just focus on just like a single skill that you're looking for. So for discard counting, uh, the bot games help a lot. Um, I also have a thing called um, reverse discard pattern recognition, which is basically looking at the different discards uh, and then kind of trying to figure out like what meaning do they have uh, for discards that came out in an unnatural order. And a good way to you know confirm this and do it is via Tenho reviews because you can go at your own pace. You can slowly look at the entire board. Then you can even like check your answers and see like what misunderstandings that you had that were wrong, what were right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, y- you're on your own time. You don't have to like do it in the middle of a game where you- everyone has like a 10 second timer, and you know you're having to worry about all this other stuff. You're just focusing on the thing that you want to get. Um, internalizing hand patterns. Um, X Kime mentioned something like this before as well. Uh, where you have like an unsorted single player mahjong, so you just set it down at like a table. You have an unsorted hand, you flip it up, and you just kind of like play from beginning to end without sorting your hands. Uh, what that can do is help uh, basically internalize the patterns in your head, so that you're not having to spend as much time looking at your hands, and you can spend more time looking at the board. Similarly, uh, mind branding practice is a practice where you have a set of tiles. Um, you have them flipped down, and then you flip them up, look at them for like a number of seconds, and flip them back down. Then you have to basically say, what were all the tiles in your hand? Uh, this is actually a practice from uh, Katayama Sensei's uh, manga, the same guy that uh, wrote a manga that the majority of Dinah's uh, Richie Book 1 is written up, is actually based off of. Uh, and so this also helps you, like, you know, be able to like remember tiles in your hands uh which for like in real games it helps you remember like oh yeah i was in this situation and i had like this hand uh for a little bit more practical situations um it can help you uh basically know your hand without having to constantly look at it so that you have more time to spend looking on other people's hands so yeah those are some examples of isolated practices and then, going on to the next thing, we have in-game practices. So, these are things in-game. So, some practices are really hard to do uh, outside of an actual game. So, what you do instead is you do an actual game, and then instead of just, like, I don't know, um, Worrying about, like, oh, I got first, oh, I got fourth. You're worrying about your specific um, thing that you're doing. So let's say you have a really bad habit of, like, pushing your hand when you shouldn't be pushing your hand. And you you look at the review and you're like, wow, of course I shouldn't have been pushing my hand. What am I doing there? That's stupid. Uh, but you keep making that mistake in game. So you're like, all right, how do I fix this? So this is one thing, this is, like, one example I did in the past, uh, push-pull. So every single time I draw a tile, I have to ask myself, like, audibly ask myself, uh, should I push this hand or should I, you know, be folding right here? So I have, it's, it's basically every single time I'm asking, all right, look at this situation. Do I, should I be fighting or should I be running away? Then I have to answer, you know, fight or run, and then go through with that. And then do that for every single discard, for ev- or for mine, for every single discard f- across the entire game. You're constantly reminding yourself, like, all right, do I fight or do I run? Do I fight or do I run? Uh, and then how you did in that game is not necessarily like, you know, yeah, oh, I got first or fourth. It's, all right, did I ask myself every single time, push or pull? Did I actually look at the information? Did I actually answer to the best of my ability? Yes? Great. You did good. Continue until you don't have to. <laughs> uh, another example is opponent push-pull after, like, a Richie uh, or a Dora pawn. So let's say someone declares Richie. After that point, I look at every single opponent's discards, and I say, what was that discard that they dropped? Was it a safe tile? Was it, like, not a safe tile? If it's not a safe tile, what, what does that mean? If it is a safe tile, like, how, like, what type of safe tile is it? Are they pushing or are they pulling? Are they fighting this reach or are they not fighting this reach? And then from there, you can gain some stuff like, oh, if they're fighting this reach, but they're not in reach themselves... What does that mean? Are they not in temp by yet? Or maybe they're even waiting on a tile that the opponent reached with. Uh, some other examples. Uh, number of safe tiles for each opponent. So each time it's your turn, you just say, like, I have, like, this many safe tiles for this person, this person, this person. Uh, number of seen door tiles. Each time it's your turn, you can just say, like, how many door tiles do I see? Uh, if you, let's say, had, like, a problem 
where you, you kept pushing in a, like a late game situation even though you saw like no Dora tiles out. This is like a reminder for that. So all these practices are very specific to skills that you want to build. Uh, so I can't just say like, yeah, go do these. Uh, though you could do those if you know you have a similar problem, but look at your games, find out what are your problems, and then you want to figure out like, all right, how do I fix these problems? Practices and warm-ups are something that you do to fix problems. Uh, you're basically saying like, all right, this is like the thing that I have right here. Um, how do I never mess this up again? Or how do I mess this up a lot less than I am right now? You want to figure out what are the core components of that? What makes up like this thing that you're trying to figure out? And then step through it and finally say, like, okay, like this is the practice that I made for this. This is the way that I, I, I feel as though I can get rid of this problem from, um, you know, if I do this. And then you basically practice it until you have a new habit that just kind of like overrides your old ones and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> it's a long, arduous process and the games are and practices that you're going to mess up are usually initially going to be pretty shit. Um, but that's okay. Like, you get feedback. You don't have to leave them the same. Uh, if you do something and you're like, wow, this would be a lot better, this would be a lot more targeted if I did this instead, then that's great. Like, always like look for chances to update your practices. Never be like stuck on just doing one thing. If you see like a, if you hear a good example, or if you like hear someone's like nice suggestion or something, you know, try stuff out. Um, you can always be better than what you are right now. So yeah, and I think that is about all for my mahjong warm up and practices. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> once again, this is a video, so uh, I will be answering any questions that you have on this by typing in the chat, so sorry about that. Uh, but I'll be probably posting this video up on YouTube after the Mahjong uh, Day stream as well. So if you're interested, yeah, just come back, check out this video. Uh, once again, for more specifics on any of the warm-ups, please visit pathofhoho.blogspot.com. Erzy's blog is amazing, and she is awesome. <laughs> All right, and that's all for me. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, everyone, from uh, Ricci Central as well. I'm out.